Hi, I'm Peter Clausen from Bugs in Cyberspace. And I just got back from doing a podcast with my friend Jesse Green from Shapes in Nature. We interviewed somebody today about sharks. And you can find that video after we get it processed over on his Shapes in Nature YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be answering some questions. I've printed these out that you guys asked me in my last video here on YouTube giving out a couple prizes, some stickers, bug stickers, here at the end of this. This is probably going to be a two-part video, so right now you're watching part one, and you guys asked me bug questions in the comments area of the last video, and I'm going to start answering them right now. First question was submitted by Gaming Boy, and he asked, I have a question do ogre face spiders need a lot of room to live in? And do they like some light or a lot of light? So gaming boy, here is an ogre face spider. That of course is the backside. And let's get a look here at the face if we can. And those disproportionately large eyes, they sort of twinkle blue when the light strikes them, and even orange like that. Let's take it in a little closer here. This is a female. And some really nice eye twinkle right there. Take it in even a little closer than that. There we go. Nice shots of the eyes. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do believe that they are primarily nocturnal. I could be wrong on that. Uh, I haven't researched them extensively, nor have I kept them very often. Um, I Everything in my bug room is subjected to light during the day and darkness at night, uh, and the normal temperature changes that come with that. Uh, for the ogre spiders, that means that it's probably light in there from about 9.30 in the morning until about nine o'clock at night, I start turning off the lights above the bearded dragon tank, for example. Lots of bugs on the shelves above that. And I leave some of the other lights on till well past midnight, usually. Um, but uh, in terms of the tank size, I would say that uh, I haven't noticed them building their little uh, traps. If you guys aren't familiar with ogre-faced spiders, they are sometimes also called gladiator spiders. And uh, they have these giant eyes, which I assume uh, means that they are nocturnal, and uh, so they're capturing their prey at night with the aid of these specialized and disproportionately large eyes that they have. I've done some videos on this species in the past. And over on the True Facts channel. Uh, he does true facts. Uh, true facts of the ogre-faced spider was one of them. And it's just a fantastic video. If you guys aren't subscribed to his channel, you definitely have to do that. Uh, go check it out. Uh, he mentioned me in the credits, which was really cool because I supplied him with some footage for his video. Um, I, will, I have noticed that they don't build their uh, their webs that they use to capture their prey, unless the tank is probably at least a gallon in size. Uh, they won't do it in a um, 32 ounce deli cup, for example, if they're adults. They're also called net casting spiders, and they won't build those little nets that they envelop their prey with unless the tank is of a certain size. So, Brandy Flakes then asked, what's your favorite species of beetle? And uh, there'll probably be another favorite question along the line. So with this one, I'll say that here in the United States, uh, 
the one that I have a tattoo of is Lucanus Elephus. And because I have a tattoo of it, you might say that it's my favorite beetle. But um, of course, there are 25%, they say, of all animals on the planet are beetles. And uh, it's really hard to pick a favorite, especially when I know so few of them. But uh, I will continue to maybe develop a good answer to that question in years to come. I haven't gotten very far with it up to this point, I guess. Spicy beans. We always have fun saying that name on Instagram when we're doing our live streams. And so their question was, how much ventilation do you generally have for isopod bins? Because some of my armadillidium vulgare are starting to die off and I cannot decide whether it is due to ventilation or some other issue. Uh, I have learned over the years to keep my armadillidium, my pill bugs, the ones that roll up into a ball, for example, and with respect to almost every species of pill bug that I keep, a little bit more on the drier side versus the sow bugs, which do not roll up. Um, it's, it's hard to say because uh, how often you add humidity into the tank depends on how much ventilation the lid or the sides of your tank has. So it's a funny thing, but uh, as long as you're checking in there every couple of weeks, uh, I almost never spray in the cage. I might not even look in there for a couple weeks at, the at a time. And only when I'm adding food in, in the form of leaves or maybe some wood or uh, little bits of produce, fruits and vegetables, uh, protein pellets, then I sometimes add in some moisture, but I just kind of eyeball it. Of course, you never want the soil to be wet, uh, just a little bit moist. It is important to them that it's never bone dry and certainly not too bone dry for long, but because I, tend not to have high ventilation for any of my tanks because uh, I'm so busy keeping so many different things that isopods, one of the things I like about them is that they are so low maintenance. If the tank is set up properly and you have a sort of long established routine of caring for them, I will look at, uh, I do have uh, employees that will pull specimens from the bins and uh, for orders but uh, I am the one who personally feeds all of the isopods for the most part, and I will just do them all at the same time every two weeks or so. And uh, it's not something that I think about anymore because I have been using these same tanks for a really long time, and while I may change the substrate out in them from time to time, I don't, uh, it's not something that I consciously have to worry about. I keep all of the uh, Armadillidium vulgare pill bugs in one particular tank, and uh, I just look at it. And if it looks like it's getting on the verge of being bone dry, I certainly spray it down, but because the lid has uh, no ventilation in it, in fact, uh, only the fact that the lid and the container base uh, are not an airtight seal. Uh, I don't. I don't have to have any additional holes in there because I spray in there so infrequently, and they get a lot of the moisture from the foods that I offer them. Um, so it's it's really just kind of a case by case basis. It's always hard to answer a question like this about how much ventilation do I have for the isopod bins uh, and. Part of that too, another factor to take into consideration is the depth of the substrate, as well as what it's composed of will affect how frequently you need to add moisture to the tank in combination with the ventilation in your lid. So there's a bunch of vari variables you have to take into consideration for each individual tank because no two tanks are alike. If you're running coconut fiber as a substrate in there, it will dry out more quickly and it's much looser. But if you have some sand mixed in there, soil mixed in there, um, then the evaporation in the substrate is going to be much slower. And uh, so, you know, the ventilation that you're asking about in the lid is really only one of the variables you need to take into consideration. And you have to look at it holistically to 
uh, address issues with humidity. So always a difficult question to answer. Those are the variables for consideration. Emperor Mothman says, hey, Pedro, my mother always called me Pedro, by the way. I, Pedro Guerrero was one of her favorite baseball players on the Dodgers, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so when I was in Little League, I would very frequently and uh, to my probably more at that time than a slight embarrassment, <laughs> I would hear up in the stands when I came up to bat, go Pedro. Anyway. <laughs> Funny that you, you called me that. Uh, whenever I go to your website, I always notice that there are no phasmids. You ever thought about rearing them and selling them? Uh, interestingly, my introduction into the online pet bug hobby was through phasmids, where I kept over a hundred different species. And if you look on the internet archives, you can actually see some of the older versions of my website. Um, at the time, it was still at the same bugsincyberspace.com URL or website address. I did previously have it listed under a different name before I had my own dedicated hosting company and uh, website name. So, but you can go back, I think, to maybe 2000 or so, maybe, maybe even older than that in the Internet Archives, 2001. I can't remember, actually and see all of those phasmids and my care sheet on there and all of the pictures I took of the ova, the eggs of each species next to a penny for a size reference. And at that time I used to use a penny from that year. So if I was taking photos in 1997, for example, I would use a penny that was a brand new shiny 1997 penny. <laughs> a little blast from the past there. The reason that I don't keep them anymore and certainly don't sell them is because they are regulated. They require permits both to have and, of course, to distribute. You and your uh, recipient both need permits for them. They are plant eaters. They are, in many cases, exotic, uh, not native to the United States. And that is the reason for that. Just a Bird asks, what's your advice for wanting to start breeding slash observing bugs in your own home, which is what I do. Also, what kind of budget tools could be used for entomology, pinning, etc.? Um, my advice for uh, starting to breed or observe bugs in your own home is uh, two different things, I suppose. You can go out and collect something uh, locally and bring it in and provide the best care that you can for it on the basis of information you can find online or uh, just common sense in a lot of cases. If you have a little bit of experience keeping other things, that can often be applied to some other new things. Uh, if you're just bringing something in from outdoors, there's a good chance that it's going to want some moisture in the tank that you're providing for it, with few exceptions. Uh, even scorpions and other desert species, they retreat into more humid burrows during the day. And of course, the other thing that you can do is to purchase some specimens online or go to a reptile show. They'll often have bugs there. And you can uh, bring those back to your home and attempt to raise and breed them. Your second question about budget tools uh, for entomology. If you're talking about pet bugs, uh, the dollar store is a really good place to do some shopping. You can get really cheap containers there. Um, you can get butterfly nets at the dollar store during at least times of the year. Uh, and as far as uh, pinning supplies, uh, you, can, you can, in most craft sections, uh, get pins themselves. Dressmaker pins are cheap, much, much cheaper than uh, entomological, uh, like real entomology supplies. The pins can be quite expensive. Uh, they look more professional. So uh, a lot of people will buy the more expensive ones uh, just for that reason alone. But I started my entire insect collection as a kid out just using, you know, the pins from my mom's sewing cabinet. Um, as far as other supplies, uh, Amazon and eBay are great places to look for spreading boards, pinning boards, and other supplies like that. I have a website called deadinsects.net where I have uh, a few supplies. Bioquip.com is another 
really, really famous and trusted historical resource for obtaining entomology supplies, and I do recommend you check them out. Mahdi, 20, from Algeria. Uh, know him from Instagram, great guy. Your channel is amazing. What's your most amazing experience and your emotions that day? Uh, it's, it's always difficult, spur of the moment like this, to come up with any specific day. Um, so just in general, my favorite moments, the thing that I look forward to, and you know, it's that same sort of Christmas feeling. It's the anticipation of whatever it is, the exciting thing you're going to do uh, is all, always a really important part in addition to what you're actually doing. So leading up to the trips that I make with my friends where we go on these uh, these wildlife expeditions, we used to call them collecting trips, but we hardly collect anything anymore because um, it's just a lot of work and it sort of changes the, the dynamic of the trip when you're going down there to collect things. And so we do very little of that with just a few exceptions anymore. Uh, Jesse Ray will collect velvet ants that he sees because he's building this massive collection of velvet ants. And so uh, he'll collect male velvet ants and female velvet ants. Um, in low numbers, just to represent their diversity in his collection. And as part of his learning experience, he has all of the books and he has contacts. And uh, it's, it's, he's, he's a person who is very interested in specific things, uh, including ground beetles is another specialty of his. Um, uh, my friend John Skierski, who goes on the trips with us, he is more into centipedes. Uh, and so that's pretty much all he tends to be looking for or taking back with him. And we never find them in great numbers anyway, and so he only takes a few of those. Um, so it, it's, it's the anticipation of those trips, it's the being on those trips, and in the case of, you can check out my, my Arizona playlist at this link up here. Uh, to see all of the memories that I make with these friends. And, you know, a lot of them aren't captured on video because we don't have the camera rolling all the time, but it's just wonderful for me, uh, sometimes years later, to watch these videos back and to remember those moments um, that we took in years gone by uh, and managed to document on camera and, uh, you know, Watching those back gets me excited about the next trip, and uh, hopefully we're going to take some fun ones next year. Uh, if the world opens up again, India is going to be on that list. Of course, we won't be bringing anything back from India, but we're going to go there and we're going to see some amazing things, including perhaps, as of uh, some of the most recent con conversations, uh, garials. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, but we're going to go to good. <laughs> I'm excited. We're going to go to the Ganges. And we're going to see these prehistoric looking, I think they're crocodiles, alligators, not sure what the difference is between those two. I'm learning about them, but they have the long slender snouts that kind of round out at the ends and lots of teeth poking out everywhere along the way. And so that will be very exciting. And uh, even though that trip could be as much as a year away or even longer, depending on when travel opens up again and is safe. Um, I think about it every single day and not just because Jesse and I talk about it every day and he is meeting new people over there and online through his shapes and nature business and um, so many amazing new opportunities are opening up to us in terms of the amazing people and places we're going to get to visit because Jesse's business is conservation oriented and he's working with people around the world to raise awareness about different kinds of animals. Very exciting, very fun. Uh, thank you for your question, Mahdi. Neon X says, where can I get good quality unmounted dead troglodaris beetle specimens for a good price? I recently made a video about the troglodaris, uh, trogs for short, and uh, I don't know if there's anywhere in the world where you can get dead specimens of troglodaris. I do have some. Um, I have not made a listing for them on my deadinsects.net website, but I have had some of them die here in my tanks. 
And so I would have to encourage you simply to shoot me an email and ask me about them. Of course, you can purchase the living specimens right through my website, which I guess is the answer for where can you find dead specimens at a good price. Purchase them live at a great price and then, you know, care for them, make your observations about them, enjoy them, and I promise you they won't live forever. Also, any darkling beetles would be cool, but especially Troglodaris. I do have a variety of darkling beetles available on the Deadstock website too, although you may have to contact me about those because I have them in my freezer and uh, I don't represent the diversity of what I do have dead in my freezer through that website because it's a lot of onesie twosie stuff and it would be um, counterproductive to list each individual beetle that I have uh, up there on the website. Uh, he also asks, or she, where can I purchase live cocoons in the U.S.? Uh, that's something that you're going to have to Google. I have seen them on uh, Carolina Biological. Uh, they will only ship to some states. Uh, eBay, Amazon might have something for you in that regard. Uh, there are some people that will ship from other countries, but you want to have your permits, import documents in place before you do that. So. Uh, you know, you're just gonna, I, I don't make those purchases myself. I never buy anything like that. Um, I will pop in a little clip here at this point from something uh, that a friend brought over, uh, Jessica, who works for me, brought them over the other day to work for show and tell. And so uh, enjoy a small video clip here about Antharina Soraka. Three days later, here's the mail, Antheria Soraka, and Jessica just brought this female over this morning. Fresh female, she just hatched during the night, did you say? Yeah. I really like her coloration. And just a moment ago, well, there she did it a little bit, moving those eye spots back and forth. Here it is, flexing on us. And just maybe these two will pair up. Jessica has a couple more cocoons. See what happens. Not the best time of year to get eggs and hatch larvae with the oak trees on the verge of dropping their leaves, but we'll see what happens. From Madagascar originally, this species, but these are captive bred. And then Neon X asked another question who, uh, he says, are you ever going to sell some young rhino roaches for a more normal person friendly price? Uh, will I ever sell cheap rhino roaches? Um, I will probably for as long as they are lower in supply than demand be listing them at the market price um, that's just the fair and reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, arguably, for the sake of argument, I could just give them away for free, or I could charge $1,000 each for them. But uh, I never try to gouge anybody with my prices. Um, but out of respect for the market and all of the hard work I've done over the years and all of the hard work other keepers have done over the years and are continuing to do with that species, I think it's very important and fair to keep the price at what is called the market price uh, for those. And it depends on who you ask as to what that market price is. But I think that it's safe to say that if somebody put them up online for $200 a baby, they would have no problem selling them at that price. They may have to sit on them for a week or two or a month. They may grow a little bit larger. Uh, they would sell them for that because there is somebody out there who is willing to pay that price for them. Um, this is just how the world works. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, if you do end up getting some yourself, uh, and uh, you breed them, you're probably also going to sell them at a market price. I assure you, <laughs> you're going to um, come into the fold in terms of how you deal those out. Uh, 
what's the next question here? That completes the first page. So Philip Hoang says, what are some major tips breeding Lucanus elephas and what are some good reasons to tell my parents to buy for my female, buy a male for my female? Also, um, so he's got a long series of questions here. We'll just take them one at a time. Uh, my best tip for uh, breeding Lucanus elephas is to uh, drop an, an oak log about this big into uh, some oak flake soil substrate and have a female who's been fertilized and put her in there. Uh, you can before you drop the, uh, you know, buried or partially buried oak log into your substrate, uh, bore some holes into it, some little starter points perhaps to encourage the female to choose those spots to deposit her eggs. And they'll often uh, create some sawdust around those openings. And uh, by drilling into it a little bit, you may encourage her to lay in there, choose those spots. Um, it's, it's all about encouragement. It's important that the, uh, the log is slightly rotted so that, um, you know, or you can soak it in water a little bit so that's a little bit humid um, to encourage her. It's a tricky thing though, and uh, a lot of people fail with it. And uh, a lot of keepers who have kept them many times before, um, they, they go through periods where it, everything works out really well and then sometimes it doesn't. So. Uh, it's, it's still a little bit challenging to get it to work even for people who have done it before. Um, what are some good reasons to tell my parents to buy a male for my female? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's tricky to answer. Uh, you know, your, 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 your parents care about you and you care about beetles. <laughs> and so, uh, I would just say to them that, you know, it's, it's your, your female beetle's biological destiny or purpose to have a male and that uh, they know how much you love beetles and they know that you have one sex of them. And so, you know, you really want to have that other sex so that uh, when your beetle dies, that you will be able to carry on this hobby. And I suppose you could explain to them that um, when your beetle dies, you're going to want another beetle. And if they would just allow you to purchase this other beetle now, it might be the last time you ever have to ask for another Lucanus elephas beetle, because if you can get them reproducing, get a breeding program going, you will be able to sustain that for perhaps years to come and you won't continue to bug them about purchasing more of that species of beetles in the future every single year. So how's that for an answer? Uh, and then uh, I think he asked if I was going to get any more adults in the future and uh, that's just hit or miss. I, I don't know. I don't have any on the radar. I never do for that species, but uh, occasionally people contact me. I've got a few people that contact me about that species and ask me if I want to purchase for resale some of their, uh, their captive bred adults in most cases. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Yes. Not your average aquarist asked, any chance you will be selling velvet worms? I left a comment on your velvet worm video, but I know YouTube is really weird with notifying people about new comments, so I will leave a comment here as well. I did see your other comment. I did reply to your other comment, and I appreciate your interest in them. And coincidentally, I just got a shipment of velvet worms in. A couple velvet worms here. Put my finger down there for a moment, just so you can see a size reference for them. These are the species originally from the Barbados, but that have been captive bred for many generations now. I'm going to do a whole setup video on these amazing creatures soon. I'll set a tank up for them and probably won't happen because they're so secretive. But one of my goals is always to capture their feeding behavior on video.
be doing a setup video here on YouTube about the new tank I'm putting together for them. And, uh, and I'm going to be offering some of them too. Uh, that's all I'm willing to say about it at this point because uh, I, th I think I'm going to do the video before I offer them for sale so that we can generate the maximum amount of excitement and interest in the topic. Grant asked, have you looked into selling Pogana Miramex Occidentalis? I have, that's an ant species, I believe the Western Harvester ant. Um, I am, I, I'm probably never going to sell ants. Uh, there are some interstate travel issues with them. And uh, I just have so many things on the website already and providing care for ants is a little out of my wheelhouse, as they say. Um, I, I'm, I wanna say butterfly house or insect house or something like that, but <laughs> I said wheelhouse. Um, I just, I, I'm not there yet. That might change. I'm not saying I never will, but we'll see. Desarid asked, what is your preferred way of cleaning tanks for new residents? Are there any particular chemicals you use or avoid? With very, very few exceptions, I never clean my tanks. With very, very few exceptions, <laughs> within those exceptions, I never use any chemicals on them. Um, if I'm making a video, I will sometimes uh, pull one of my old tanks out. Uh, a good example that I was just referring to, I'm going to be making the velvet, velvet worm video. I always want to say velvet ant because I get them so much more frequently than velvet worms. So if I say the wrong thing at some point in this video, excuse me, please. Um, I will probably use one of my old five or 10 gallon tanks for that new velvet worm tank and because I want it to be presentation worthy or something close to that for the video, I may use some Windex on it, but I am going to rinse and re-rinse and re-rinse and re-rinse that tank afterwards and wipe it down really good if I use any chemicals in there. And not just because velvet worms probably have really permeable skin and would be much more sensitive to the chemicals in the Windex, the ammonia and whatnot. Uh, but I might not do that. It just depends on how dirty the, the tank is. Uh, in general, I never clean any tanks. Um, and in fact, I will often reuse the same substrate or portions of it just because it has a really established microbial balance. And uh, using fresh new substrate in a new tank, you're often going to see a microbial war in the form of mold uh, happen there in the tank in the first month or two. It's just a cycling process that almost every new tank has to go through. And so I get a lot of questions about that. People will tell me that they purchased my substrate or somebody else's substrate and that mold broke out in the container. And that's almost inevitable. Uh, and especially if you're entirely using new substrate. So, you know, you might use a little bit of old substrate with some of the new substrate to help establish that balance there. Um, I guess that answers that. Uh, Bethany Swire says, Hi, Peter. I do appreciate your video about blue bottle fly care. It really helped me. I do wonder if you sell jumping spiders and or list of items and insects that you do sell as I would be interested in purchasing. Thank you so much. And she says, P.S. I'm always a Star Wars fan. Um, I frequently get emails or inquiries like this on social media from people who say, you know, do you have a price list? And many, 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 many years ago before I had a website, which is 24 years ago now, I used to have a price list like so many other people who post on forums and whatnot do. I haven't created a price list for so long because I have a website. That website is currently, in terms of the shopping cart, at shop.bugsandcyberspace.com. However, I'm going to be dropping that shop prefix off here pretty soon, and it's just going to be at bugsincyberspace.com. So please check out my website if you would like to see my availabilities. Uh, we are still going through the social distancing regulations here. I'm down one employee, and so I'm managing how much inventory I list up on the website just so that we can keep up with orders because we are short-staffed. 
So many things appear as out of stock. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are out of stock. More often it means that I'm not listing them up there because it's uh, Saturday, for example, Monday is the next shipping day, and I already have so many orders that Jessica, who works for me, and I are going to be inundated with them on Monday and Tuesday. And so I'm sorry it has to be this way right now. I do miss how efficient the business runs with three or more people, um, but uh, that's just how things are right now. And uh, I've, I've grown comfortable with uh, being the one who has to personally go out there and make a few substrates for my customers every week. I've also grown comfortable, I'm sorry to say, with having to tell people, you know, and, and re-explain this situation over and over again. Um, that's just how it is right now, and uh, I'm doing my best both to provide my customers with what they want and also to um, you know, make all of this manageable for myself so that I can continue to enjoy it and get a reasonable amount of sleep every night. Uh, you had asked about jumping spiders as well. I just got a bunch of new Regal jumpers in and I listed some on the website. They're probably showing as sold out again because I only list two at a time because people wait for a month or two for these things sometimes. And if I were to list all of the ones that I got in on the website, some pet store or something would come along, buy them all because I have them listed at a cheaper price than most people do. And so I only dole out a few at a time so that everybody who is a customer of mine has an opportunity to purchase them. And uh, thank you for your interest, Bethany. Uh, Luz, L-U-Z, asks, my question, how are you keeping Portland weird lately? And so that's something that I hashtag on Instagram frequently. Uh, Keep Portland weird is a, is a phrase, uh, motto, I guess, for the city of Portland, uh, one of several. And uh, I've been keeping Portland weird my entire life in terms of the bugs, and uh, that's, that's pretty much how I'm going to go out to doing bug stuff. <laughs> what is my favorite scorpion? K asks. Uh, I don't typically pick favorite things. In terms of U.S. species, I really like the Euroctonus mordax. They call them California forest scorpions. Um, they're really cool. They remind me a lot of flat rock scorpions, the African flat rock scorpions, uh, troglodytes. Uh, those are some of my favorites too for their flat appearance. They're uh, especially large claws and then they're almost comically skinny little tails. I really like the way those look. Um, I like I like all scorpions. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of other ones that I really, really like and lots of names of scorpions are coming to mind but uh, they're all cool in their own ways. Uh, I've may, maybe said this before here, but scorpions are my favorite arachnid group. So uh, big fan of all of them. And then we have another question here from Bug Slayer. Is there any way I can buy adult emerald euphoria beetles? And will you sell adult harlequin flower beetles soon? Uh, I may never sell the adult Euphoria beetles. They are a beautiful uh, sort of prismatic. Uh, they look like emeralds, which is why they're called emerald euphorias. You look into them and there's this depth in them. Uh, like you're, you're looking down into the center of the beetle, um, like, like the jewel, an emerald, um, but they can be other colors too and sort of shimmer with other colors, uh, oranges and, and reds even, uh, so pretty. Uh, the adult harlequins I do tend to have from time to time and their availability is based on um, the, the larval cycle when they pupate and then sometimes we have more adults uh, than we need to breed the next generation with. And so we list them on the website. That concludes the uh, first set of questions here and I'll be back in a little bit to answer.